All right, so while I'm loading this up, my name is Omar Mirza. I'm one of the third year cardiology fellows, and today I'll be talking about AFib in the ICU. Where are you from, Omar? <laughs> <laughs> I'm from Kansas originally, obviously. Um, but here we go. All right. All right. So today we're going to talk about AFib in the ICU in seven minutes. All right. So today's objectives are to be able to differentiate AFib from other atrial arrhythmias, understanding key pathologies that are going to change your management overnight, and then implement the appropriate pharmacotherapies when appropriate. And unfortunately, don't have any financial disclosures just quite yet. So, of course. This happens for that patient that is, don't worry about him, he's just transferring out in the morning, has a little bit of a rhythm change overnight, and while you're running to grab that EKG, what are you exactly taking a look at? Well, you can see it's a narrow complex tachyarrhythmia, so you're trying to figure out what's going on in the atria. So what are you gonna focus on? If the atria are contracting normally, and in the normal P wave axis, it should be upright in lead two or in the inferior leads, and then given its proximity towards the atria, V1 and V2 are good markers as well. So, if the atria are contracting normally and the P waves are upright, then this is normal sinus tachycardia. But what if the P waves look a little bit different, or they're actually inverted, like they're coming from a completely different focus? This is more consistent with an atrial tachycardia. Now, sometimes ATAC can be a little bit tricky and can have a similar P wave axis like sinus tachycardia, which is why you have to use some other markers like your heart rate trend. So in your heart rate histogram, a, uh, a, uh, TAC comes from a separate focus, so you're going to have an abrupt rise in your rate and your heart rate. And it's going to be a pretty steady one heart rate that's going to go on from an ATAC, unlike sinus TAC that has a pretty significant sinus node variability. But what happens if there's more than one focus that's actually going on? More specifically, three. So if you have three different P wave morphologies that are bouncing along here, this is more consistent with MAT, or multifocal atrial tachycardia. Now, these are all very common dysrhythmias that you're going to see in the ICU, but none of these require anticoagulation, unlike this guy over here. So this one, with negative P wave deflections in the inferior leads, are becoming from an abnormal focus that goes along the cavotricuspid isthmus, more consistent with atrial flutter. But, Omer, this isn't what's going on with our guy over here. We can't even see what's going on with the P waves over here, so let's take a look a little bit closer at the atria itself. So in this one, in 90% of cases, there's actually abnormal foci coming from the pulmonary veins, which is a little bit abnormal. And when the pulmonary vein sends out a signal, it's kind of like throwing a rock along a pond. Start sending out ripple of activity throughout, but the pulmonary vein fibers are all irregularly displaced. So all the atria get activated at different times and different places. So the atria are kind of lying that they're contracting together or they're kind of fibbing a little bit, or afib. So what's exactly causing that AFib? So there's a slew of different things that could be causing the increased foci, increase in adrenergic tone, increase in atrial stretch, or is there an abnormality in how the electrical signal is actually going across the atria itself, like fibrotic remodeling, or abnormalities between the actual electrical channels itself. Now, I'm not gonna belabor the points of every single potential etiology, because there's a slew of cases that you're gonna see in the ICU that have many of these that don't go into AFib with RVR. So what do you need to know overnight? Or what are some key um, clinical conditions that are gonna change your medical management, as well as see if a cardioversion is actually gonna stick, like thyrotoxicosis or acute decompensated heart failure. Big picture, AFib is usually a sign of something underlying as well. Now, when you go to that room with a patient with AFib with RVR, you gotta make a decision pretty quickly, a little faster than this guy, if the patient is stable or unstable. Meaning, do I have time to block them or do I gotta shock them? Now, if they're hemodynamically unstable, they have evidence of poor perfusion, pretty simple. Go ahead and shock. So this is gonna be your synchronized, high voltage, 200 joules of biphasic delivery of cardioverting. Then you start worrying about anticoagulation afterwards. If they're stable and you're considering a cardioversion because it's difficult to rate control, call a friendly cardiologist because there's a couple things you gotta figure out. One, if the AFib episode has been going on for more than 48 hours, we have to make sure there's not an intracardiac thrombus. And then, regardless of their CHADS2 VAS score, for the next 30 days after you cardiovert them, they have to be on anticoagulation because of the risk of atrial stein. And then, last but not least, both, we have to figure out if the underlying condition is adequately treated, so is that cardioversion actually gonna stick? 
is that thyroid storm, sepsis, or acute decompensated heart failure treated well enough that our cardioverge is gonna stick. But if they're stable, you have time to block them. So I'm not gonna go over all the doses here, but hopefully you guys will have these slides later on so you can figure out the exact doses, but let's go over the pertinent information. So B is for beta blocker. As well as a great medication, quick on, quick off. It's great for adrenergically driven AFib, but the biggest risk factors is if they came in with acute decompensated heart failure or they have severe bronchospasm. Now to the second one, the L is for diltiazem. So great at rate control, but also pretty significant with negative ion entropy. So as you can see, if you have acute decompensated heart failure, you have to go down to your second line agents or amiodarone. The biggest risk is the risk of a chemical cardioversion. It's not the best agent to cardiovert somebody, but it does prove a theoretical risk. Other things, as you can see, you can see iodine in that work for amiodarone, so you gotta make sure your thyroid function, as well as checking what their underlying QTC is. Because torsades is not more fun than AFib with RBR, my friends. So the other thing is if you have a caveat to all of the above. This is when you start thinking about digoxin. Not only with renal impairment, one of the biggest things to understand is DIG is vaguely mediated. So in these patients with adrenergically driven AFib, like sepsis or thyrotoxicosis, DIG isn't going to work by itself, which is why it usually needs a beta blocker or calcium channel blocker on top of it. Now, last but not least, just in case you guys see it before we do, when you have a young patient coming in with AFib with RBR and has a wide complex tachyarrhythmia, you have to be concerned for an accessory pathway or WPW. This changes management a lot because if you try to block off that AV node, any atrial signals won't go down the AV node, it'll go down the accessory pathway. And when that gets conducted one-to-one, -one, you get VFib, which is why, again, call us. So in summary, um, if you have a patient that you have confirmed irregularly irregular tachyarrhythmia, make sure one thing, are they stable or not? If they're not, go ahead and shock them. If they are, then you have time to block them. So make sure they don't have heart failure, don't have significant bronchospasm before giving them a beta blocker, as well. If there is a significant amount of bronchospasm, you can consider DILT. Now, if they do have heart failure, make sure to check that thyroid function before going to amio. And then last but not least, you can consider digoxin, or just call us. So that's my email, if you have any questions. Thank you.